Will you join me once again in prayer? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we continue to give you thanks for the gift of this day. And we ask, oh God, that in this time of worship that you would speak either through me or in spite of me. But that above all else, we would hear with clarity what it is that you say to us this day. All of this we trust and ask in your many names. Amen. There's this wonderful old story about the king and queen of Sweden who were attending the 1980 Winter Olympic Games in Lake Placid, New York. They were attempting to get into the ice hockey game that featured the Swedish team when they were stopped by a ticket taker because their tickets were for another game on a different day. The king said that the correct tickets were in the car and asked if they would be allowed in without the correct tickets. Could you make an exception for us, please? He said, you see, I'm the king of Sweden. The ticket taker responded, sure you are, and I suppose this is the queen. (laughs) The king and Queen of Sweden ended up going back to their car to get the correct tickets, only to discover their car being towed away because of parking in the wrong place. I guess it's a little different being the king and queen of Sweden than, say, being the queen of England. The job obviously comes with fewer perks. In the 10th chapter of Mark, the chapter after what was just read, Jesus tells the disciples for the third time of his impending death. We are going to Jerusalem, Jesus says, and the child of God will be delivered to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and he will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Jesus might as well have been speaking a different language to the disciples because they just didn't get it. Even two of his closest disciples, James and John, Jesus predicts his death, and they don't seem to be concerned at all about the suffering that he's about to endure. Instead, they are just looking after their own selfish interests. They approach him privately, which tells us something right away, does it not? I mean, if their attempts were noble they would have probably said it in front of the other disciples. But this is a different kind of request. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do, Jesus asks. And they replied, let one of us sit on the right hand side and one on the left in your glory. So that is the desire of their heart. After Jesus' teachings of compassion for the least and the last, the lost and the lonely, they are still on a power trip. They want the places of authority and honor in what they believe will soon be Jesus' messianic realm. Let us sit, one on your right, one on your left. James and John wanted to get ahead. They were not simply asking Jesus to be chummy or a good friend. This was not a relational request, but one for power. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said, Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? 
Jesus wanted them to understand that in this realm, positions of power did not come. According to family or social connections, it had a cost to sit at this table. To ask for a place of power was also to ask for a place of suffering. The Apostle Paul makes the same point in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with Christ, so that we may also be glorified with Christ. Jesus explained that positions of honor in the realm of God were not his to give. Perhaps in our more modern era, we would nominate someone like Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King Jr. for these kinds of positions. But surely God has additional worthy servants through the ages that are many unknown to us. But it's interesting what happens next. The other 10 disciples become furious when they learn of James and John's private attempt to gain preferential treatment. The story goes on that when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Perhaps they were upset, not because they thought James and John's request was unfair, but because they too had their own selfish ambitions. Isn't it ironic and sometimes even funny how we sometimes judge others more harshly than we judge ourselves because of the same sins? The anger of the other 10 disciples may not have been motivated by the injustices of James and John's request, but by their own jealousy. And at that point, Jesus, in order to avert discord and disunity among the 12, calls them together and he begins to re-emphasize the meaning of greatness and contrasts greatness of this world with the greatness of God's realm. And I believe that's where this morning's scripture reading is most highlighted. The disciples have been traveling with Jesus, and when they arrive, Jesus asks, what were you arguing about on the way? Have you ever noticed that Jesus is like a good parent, asking a question that they already know the answer to? And the writer of the gospel, according to Mark, says that they were silent. I think we can safely assume that they were silent because they were embarrassed. Because the argument was about greatness. But Jesus already knows this and they already know that Jesus knows. And instead of a back and forth, Jesus calls the disciples together and says, whoever wants to be first must first be last and servant of all. And then Jesus does this curious thing and places a child in the midst of this gathering and says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. There's no record of the conversation that had taken place but I believe it's probably safe to assume that nothing in the conversation between the disciples had anything to do with servanthood or the importance of children when discussing greatness. You see, rivalry for great honor was common among ancient Mediterranean men. The practice ranged from playful competition among friends to deadly competition among enemies. Now, Jesus' disciples were not enemies, but it's probable that they had gone beyond playful banter. 
This is the proverbial biblical, be careful what you ask for. James and John wanted honor and privilege. They wanted titles and responsibility. They, nor any of the disciples for that matter, did not want to hear about being last or serving. And probably wanted to hear nothing about the importance of children. And I wonder how often we struggle with the same thing. What does it mean to be an intergenerational church? What does it mean to welcome children and families with young children into our midst? How does that impact us as a church both today and tomorrow? You may be familiar with the name Harry Hopkins. Hopkins was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's closest advisor during much of his presidency, and I've recently become increasingly familiar with Hopkins due to some reading that I've been doing. During World War II, when his influence with Roosevelt was at its peak, Hopkins held no official cabinet position, and this disturbed many people. Hopkins had become a political liability to the president, And a political foe asked Roosevelt, why do you keep Hopkins so close to you? Surely you realize that people distrust and resent his influence. Roosevelt replied, someday you may well be sitting here where I am now as president of the United States. And when you are, you will look at that door over there knowing that practically everyone who walks through it wants something from you. You'll learn what a lonely job this is and you'll discover the need for someone like Harry Hopkins who asks nothing except to serve. It's said that Winston Churchill rated Hopkins as one of the half dozen most powerful men in the world in the early 1940s. The sole source of Hopkins' power was his willingness to serve. And I believe that Jesus looks for those who are willing to serve. But serving as Jesus seeks also means loving whom Jesus loves. In his book, The Jesus Style, Gail Irwin described servanthood this way. A servant's job is to do all they can to make life better for others. To free them to be everything they can be. A servant's first interest is not in themselves but others. My friends, there are all kinds of ways to serve God's people, including simple acts of kindness, but of course, there are other ways that require great acts of courage. My hope and prayer is that our hearts and our minds and our ears will be open to where it is that Jesus calls us to serve. But we better be careful what we ask for.